I want to welcome our, our speaker tonight, Pastor Micah Mack. Uh, many of you guys know him. He's come here many times for youth things. I think some of the youth think that maybe he's on staff here. He's one of our youth pastors. But he is a good friend and a, and a family member of New Hope. So would you give it up for Pastor Micah as he comes to bring the word tonight. I want to give honor to uh, Pastor Weaver and the pastoral team and staff here, and um, I guess to say I'm blown away that this many people showed up on a Monday night. Uh, that is incredible. That's amazing. You can clap for that. That's, I hadn't looked out to see who's here. Uh, this church is incredible. It's making a difference all around the world. It's impacting lives both here in the city of Urbandale and beyond, and it's impacting the world. And there's a real heart for Jesus in this place. There's a real heart for God here. For those of you who don't know me, I've got to meet some of you out uh, in the lobby and some of you here sitting down. Uh, my name is Micah, like Pastor Zach said, and I got hooked up with the best wife ever. Her name is Steph. And we have two little kids, a two and a half year old girl who just owns the world and everybody in it. And we have a four-month little old uh, little boy. And he's in the 90th percentile for his age. If you don't know what that means, he's just a big baby. Okay, he's huge. He's a big baby boy. Like, he could probably eat you. Okay, he's huge. Uh, but you will probably be seeing them if you come back tomorrow night. We literally just got here not too long ago, hopped off the little van. We live in Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, home of the Minnesota Vikings, the best NFL team possible. <laughs> And some of you are like, you're, you're delusional, buddy. Your team's not even in the playoffs. I know, okay, I know. You don't need to remind me. I know. But all the Bears fans, your team's not in the playoffs anymore too. So how about that, okay? And all you Packer fans out there, neither is your team too, okay? So we're all even. We're square, okay? But no, we're from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and uh, we were youth pastors for a while. And God called our family, my wife and I, to leave the confines of the local church, being youth pastors, to leave what we've known to be normal for 19 years, serving in Minneapolis area, and for God to send us out to go wherever he wants us to go. For the last year and four months, uh, we have stepped out as traveling evangelists and travel full time all over wherever God opens up a door. Billy Graham prayed a prayer early on in his ministry. He said, God, I will go wherever you want me to go. God, I will be whoever you want me to be. And God, as you know, expanded Billy Graham's ministry. We have stolen that prayer. We don't market ourselves. We don't email people. We don't call pastors saying, can we come preach? All we literally do is pray and fast and ask God that he would direct our steps and lead us to where we're supposed to go. And it has been amazing to see when you follow Jesus and when you obey the voice of God in your life, in every area of your life, you will be on one of the greatest adventures you could ever be on in your entire life. To say that following Jesus is boring, to say that following Jesus is not adventurous, I would tell that person you are serving the wrong God. You are serving the wrong Jesus. Jesus came to bring life and life abundantly. God's expectation for you and for your life is fullness and nothing less than nothing short of fullness. God is good no matter where you are, no matter where you've been. God is still good and he's still on the throne. And we've been able to experience God's favor, God's providence on our ministry. In just a year and four months, we've seen close to 4,000 people give their lives to Jesus. We've seen countless people healed, physical healings, uh, you name it. We were just in Texas two nights ago for a three-day uh, weekend, sowing and ministering there in Texas. Right when we leave here, late Wednesday night or early Thursday morning, we're taking off to Wisconsin to do ministry in Wisconsin. It has been incredible to see uh, God open up doors and open up opportunities. More of heaven is what we've come to. More of heaven is why we're here. In fact, the very reason that you're here on a Monday night shows me and tells me that you probably walked in the door with some sort of expectation, some sort of opportunity to trust God for more, or to want more, to see more of God in your life. And so it's a blessing for me to see everybody here. God has put three things on my heart over the next three nights as we spend our times together. More of heaven inside of you, more in heaven through your life. Tonight is what we're going to talk about. Tomorrow night, more of heaven in your family. 
your grandkids, your kids, if you're not married yet, you and your family, your surrounding family, and then more of heaven here in our city and here in our world. Those are the three things we're going to go after. We're going to let the word of God speak to us, and then we're going to respond. We may do some prophetic exercises where I take you through some exercises to operate in the prophetic. We may do those kinds of things. God has put an expectation and an anticipation in my heart for every single person in the room to encounter and to experience him. Christ was meant not to be read about or not necessarily even to know about. Christ was meant to be experienced. He was meant to be met face to face in a personal relationship. Just as I can talk to you and speak to you and you hear my voice, God desires to speak to every single one of us uniquely, a specific way to you. God is speaking, he has spoken, he still is speaking today. And I have a huge anticipation in my heart where Psalm 34 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. God is meant to be experienced and God desires to experience relationship with you and I. So my prayer in my heart is tonight you would experience Christ. You would experience God, although you know for maybe some of the seasoned believers in the room, we do not hinge our faith merely on experience or experience alone, but we hinge our faith on the word of God and what God has spoken, what God has said and what he's written in his word. If we lived our faith merely on feelings, we would all be in trouble, right? We'd all be in trouble. But we are called in, to taste and see and know that God is good. God has put an expectation and an anticipation in my heart to see bodies healed, to see families restored, marriages re-experience the life that they first once felt, and to see God do whatever it is that he wants to do. The song we sang early tonight, talking, earlier tonight talking about more of heaven, God, we just want you to do whatever. We don't care. We don't care. When somebody comes to a spot where they are in full surrender and a posture of complete surrender, God has the authority and the power to do whatever he wants to do in somebody's life. What God is looking for is not someone that can build their life and make it come together and make it all look shiny and nice. What God is looking for is ordinary, broken people who have a sin nature, surrender their life, surrender their hearts and mind to Christ so Christ can do what he wants to do in and through your life. The quicker we realize this life is more about God than it is us, the more we will understand and experience God's kingdom and his heaven here on earth in our lives. God desires more of you. You know, in America, we're living in a time where it's a very individualistic society. It has been that way for years. And I'm excited to see that a church in Iowa is dedicating three nights specifically, well, actually more, four nights starting last night. But you are dedicating and set aside time to start the year to say, Jesus, we want more of you. Back, back in the early church when the Holy Spirit was poured out, it was common to see groups of people meeting together. It was common to see people praying together and worshiping together. In fact, sometimes I wish churches didn't have pews. Sometimes I wish churches were just done in circles so that we could look each other in the eye, pray for one another, and worship God upward. We were meant to do life together, and God can do incredible things when a group of people humble themselves, turn from their wicked ways, and pray and seek his face. In America, we desperately need a move of God. In America, we desperately need a move of his Holy Spirit. Apart from him, we are corrupt. Apart from him, we are lost. The one thing that I know is that scripture teaches how a land is healed is when people who are called by my name, I'm not talking about the pagans or the people who are lost or even the people who aren't here tonight, but the people who are called by my name, you and I in the room, would humble themselves turn from your wicked ways, pray and seek my face. Tonight, I believe what's going to happen to a lot of us in the room is it's going to be a big reality check for you and I. It's very easy in our society today to find someone to point the finger at, to put the blame on a politician, to put the blame on a president, to put the blame on Islam, to put the blame on so many different things, on terrorists and evil acts in the world, when really what we need to be saying is, God, search my heart. Examine my heart. Are there any grievances towards you through my life? How am I grieving the Holy Spirit? How am I denying God's power and access to my life? God, where have I wronged you? God, where is the sin in my life? We are quick to judge and quick to point the finger when the Holy Spirit reminds us that we desperately need his forgiveness and love too. We need his presence. We need more of heaven in us. You know, 
Some of you may have come in the room tonight in all different kinds of areas of your life or find yourself in different areas, and the message I preach tonight, you might say, this message doesn't really fully apply to me because I'm in a really good spot with Jesus. I really don't have sin in my life. Everything's going good. My job's going great. I just got a promotion. My family seems to be doing well. Everything at home is in check. My grades are good in school. There's not really any drama between my friends. And that might be the position at where you're at. But I just want to say one thing as maybe a warning. And that is there was a man who could say maybe something of a similar response that I just gave you. A man who saw everything as going good. A man who saw victory in his life. A man who saw God operate and God move. A man who thought everything was fine and okay. Until there was a day he was walking about in the palace and saw a woman bathing there. And he saw a woman and it led to adultery, it led to lust, and then it led up to an affair and it ended up leading to killing someone. That person being David. David was at the high peak of his ministry, the high peak of his life. David was a man after God's own heart. Everything seemed to be going good, not really any sin in his heart. But he was in the wrong place at the wrong time as he should have been out in the battle. And David experienced sin. There was sin in his life. And the thing that can zap more of heaven through us and allow us not to experience more of heaven, the number one thing that can wipe that out is sin. There are three things in your life that if you allow into your life on a regular daily basis, there will be more of heaven in you. These three things are laid out in scripture in a matter of two verses. And if these three things can get inside of our hearts, get inside of our minds, we will experience more of heaven in us. Jesus came to bring about a new kingdom and a new order. Jesus came to establish his kingdom on earth. The Jews expecting one of power, one of ruling and overthrowing the Roman government. Jesus had a different kingdom in mind. One who came for the poor, the broken, the oppressed. One who came for the widows, the deaf, the blind. One who came to set the captive free. One who came to deliver the demonic. That is why Jesus came to seek and save the lost of the world. Jesus established his kingdom. He set it up the way his father wanted it to go. And there are three things that if we apply these in our life, there will be more of heaven on us. As Jesus prayed, God, let your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is possible to be a human being in the room and experience more of heaven because the very thing Christ came to do and bring was to bring heaven here on earth. Here are the three things. Number one, a pure heart. A pure heart. David, in Psalm 51, where I'm leading us tonight, it's his confession to God. And David laments before the Lord, and the couple of verses I want to focus on is Psalm 51, verse 10, where David says, Create in me a pure heart, O God. Create in me a pure heart, O God. David was begging for mercy for the Lord. David was trying to cover up his sin, thought everything was fine, thought he had everything under control until the prophet Nathan confronted him on his sin. Then there was a godly sorrow that entered into his heart, and David asked for a pure heart. Why in the world would David ask God, God, give me a pure heart? The reason being is this, is because wherever impurity reigns in our life, wherever impurity takes root and exists in our life, we lose sight of who Jesus is, and it cuts off God's blessing in our life. David was asking God for a pure heart. God created me a pure heart. The reason being is because the very nature and very character of who God is, is that our God is a holy God. He is a holy God. And because God is a holy God, he cannot look upon sin. He cannot exist with sin because God is pure and perfect and in turn when he heals someone and restores someone the result is purity God created me a pure heart this is a very big passion point of mine today as I feel like one of the things that lacks in our daily lives is going about following Christ is we lack desiring a holy life we lack desiring the holiness that God has for you and I and in turn, we compromise. In turn, we cut off the truth. In turn, in turn, we take what God has said through Scripture and we twist it to make it fit our ideal of God. But the deal is this. We cannot twist the words of Scripture. We cannot change what God has spoken and what God has said. What God has said is truth. 
We cannot bend the word of God to our liking, but God has spoken and what he calls sin is sin. And I'm afraid today, we are afraid to preach in churches today about the holiness of God. We're really, when mankind encounters God, the first thing they understand about encountering God is they encounter his holiness. You want to know what the holiness of God does to ordinary men? It makes them say, woe is me. I'm undone. I'm destroyed. I'm annihilated. I'm a filthy individual. Know who said that? The prophet Isaiah, who was a mouthpiece for God. Someone who is to be used by God, the most, one of the most righteous people on earth, saying he is filthy. Our righteousness is that of filthy rags. And when we encounter God, no wonder David was saying, create in me a pure heart, O oh God. Because apart from purity, my relationship with you is so tainted. I see this happening today in the next generation where there's no concept of morality really anymore. Truth is kind of going out the way. Whatever's true for you is true for you. Whatever makes you happy is fine. And this has bled into our society. Now in marriage and beyond and so many different things, things are changing at a rapid rate. We desperately need the holiness of God and the conviction of God back in our country and back in our churches today. We desperately need the conviction of the Holy Spirit over our minds and over our hearts. God, convict me. God, expose your holiness to me. Let there not be anything in me that grieves your heart. And just because you haven't sinned in a while or just because you're out of a sin addiction and that's no longer you doesn't mean that there might not be impurity in your heart. God created me a pure heart. Our God is a holy God. And I'm afraid there's teaching that has slipped into the church today that says we can live however we want to live because the grace of God is there. No! We can't live how we want to live. We can't be our own God and make up what's acceptable and what's not. We've got to come under the authority of God's word and the authority of scripture. The reason why God desires holiness for our life because it's his best plan all along. And it's who he is. Yet you and I have sin natures and it's a whole lot more easier to sin than it is to do something that's right. We experience that struggle every day. And by the way, <laughs> How many of y'all know it's really hard to be an ordinary person when we live in a really dirty world? It's like those in the military who go into battle. How can you expect them to be without blood or dirt on their uniforms when they're in the middle of a war, in the middle of a fight? As Christ followers, we are called to be sanctified. We operate in the righteousness of Christ. We are clothed with the same clothes that were on Christ. We walk in that. And I thank God for the bloodshed of Jesus Christ that washes away all my sin and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. You want to know how you live in a dirty world? You stay under the blood of Jesus. You ask the blood of Jesus to wash you every morning. Before you go to bed at night, you ask the Holy Spirit, where have I wronged you? God, I receive your forgiveness. It's not a matter of God forgiving you. He's already forgiven you through the cross. It's a matter of receiving his forgiveness and choosing to keep walking in humility and following him. God, give me a pure heart. Create in me a pure heart. You want to see more of heaven in you? Ask God every day for a pure heart. Jesus said, blessed are those who are pure in heart, for they will see God. You want to see more of heaven in your life? You want to see more of God taking root in your life? Then live a pure life. Ask God for the power. Ask God for the forgiveness. Ask God for the healing. Ask God for the freedom. Sometimes I think our life is a lot like this head of lettuce. We go to God and we meet Christ for the first time and maybe you end up meeting Christ and your life looks a lot like a head of lettuce. You come to Jesus for the first time. You give your life to him. He saves you. He redeems you. But because of your former ways or your past life, the more you follow Christ, Christ in John 15 talks about how his father is the vine and how Christ, what he does is he prunes us. And all of us as human beings, we're like layers and we have all these different layers to us. 
Let me, know, let me show you what it looks like to follow Christ. The more you follow Christ, the closer you are to him, the more he begins to peel back the layers in your life of sin, the more he begins to peel back the sin nature in your life, the more that he exposes things that are hidden that you didn't even know about. Jesus gives you the Holy Spirit, which leads you into all truth, which is a counselor, which is a teacher. And some of us sometimes, we walk about our life not knowing that there's hidden sin or things that we're doing currently that take up space that were never meant to be there. But the closer you are to Jesus, the more he reveals the condition of your life and he begins to take away and begins to prune every dead branch that's in your life. The reason why Christ prunes you and the reason why Christ peels back the layers is because Christ desires for you to experience fruit. Christ desires for you to see fruit in your life that lasts. And how many of you know if you watch your child and you're a parent in the room and you know something's causing death in their life, the one of the things you want to do is take it away and remove it from their life. When you follow the Holy Spirit, I am 32 years old. I come from a broken home. I've watched my dad cheat on my mom and divorce my mom. There's been generational sin patterns within my family. I've watched my grandpa cheat on his wife. I've watched different things take place. And to this day, no joke, the Holy Spirit will still wake me up in the middle of the night and reveal layers to me in my life or in my parents or grandparents that I didn't know were there. And the reason why the Holy Spirit reveals those things to us is so that, God, would you create in me a pure heart? Would you create in me a pure heart? The minute the Holy Spirit shows you a wicked thing or something that's taking root in your life or he's about to peel off another layer, don't run away from it. Invite the Holy Spirit in to help you bring about forgiveness in that area of your life. A lot of us deal with behavioral problems, but we never actually go to the root. Allow the Holy Spirit to bring you to the root so that layer of your life can be freed up. You know what I love about Psalms and what David says? If you notice just a couple verses before, David says in verse 8, let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Check this out. David says, let the bones you have crushed rejoice. This is the heart of God. You want to know what shepherds would do back then? David being a shepherd boy before he was king. You want to know what shepherds would do? When there was a wayward sheep, and a sheep would always be running away and not obey the shepherd, the shepherd would go and get the sheep, it would break the legs of the sheep. The reason why it break the legs of the sheep is so that the sheep couldn't keep wandering away. But you want to know what the shepherd would do? The shepherd would pick up the sheep, put it on its shoulder, and the shepherd would carry that sheep until the sheep could finally put weight on its legs and walk again. And you want to know what that sheep would do the minute they had the strength and their legs were healed? The sheep would follow the shepherd. God does the same thing to us. He leads us to a spot of brokenness and despair and how David felt. Create in me a pure heart, O oh God. The bones you've crushed in me, David being a shepherd, God crushing the bones right out from under David, David not able to limp, David not able to walk. God, his father, picks him up, shoulders him on. David saying, God, I get it. Forgive me. I messed up in a really bad way, and the bones that have been broken, you've held me, God created me a pure heart so that I might follow you and teach others the ways they should go. Every time guilt exists in your life, it ruins the power of the testimony that's within you. Every time guilt exists in your life, it will shut your mouth. What we desperately need is a pure heart. God created me a pure heart. The three things to have more of heaven in you, a pure heart, and then the second one being a steadfast spirit. A pure heart and a steadfast spirit. David goes on to say, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. The word steadfast means this, firmly fixed in place. David wandered away from the truth David wandered away from what God wanted him to do. He was not firmly placed in the truth. He was a wavering man. And now David not only says, God renew, created me a pure heart, but now he's saying, God renew a steadfast spirit within me. If you want to watch more of heaven in you, know what it means to ask God for a steadfast spirit. One that doesn't go to the left or to the right. One that does not follow the way of sinners and the way of death but one that follows him and him alone and him wholeheartedly. 
You want to see and know what it means to have more of heaven in you? Know what it means to anchor yourself and root yourself in Jesus Christ. To stay near to him, to follow him, to be right next to him, to be like that sheep where maybe you allow the brokenness to allow your heart to depend on the Father to restore you to a place of following and having a steadfast spirit in your heart. This is a passion point of mine for the next generation. I feel like it's real easy for those to maybe to experience God and then walk away from God. In John 10, Jesus says he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes out on ahead of them. Listen to this. His sheep follow him because they know his voice. Listen to verse 5. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. God has called us to walk in a steadfast spirit so intimately and so closely that anything contrary, anything outside the word of God and the will of God would be alarming to you to where you would never follow the voice. You would never get even close to it because the minute you smell it, the minute senses kick in, you're like, no! Where's the faith that says, as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord? Where's the faith that says, God put a steadfast spirit within me that no matter what happens in my life, I will not quit, but I will choose to follow you. That faith, that kind of faith produces a harvest. That kind of faith produces fruit. This in my hand here is an anchor and the picture God gave me tonight of what a steadfast spirit is, is us anchoring ourselves to him and us being firmly rooted in him to where yes, we have some rope because Christ trusts us and we're not robots and Christ allows us to make decisions, but the anchor to our soul is so rooted in him and we're so tied around to anchor that we don't ever depart from who God is and what he says. I've had so many opportunities to say forget God, to run away from God. People who've heard my story today, they say, why in the world did you just not give up on God? I can speak to the faithfulness of God because of moments of him anchoring me and me anchoring myself to him. Some of the things you're enduring and going through today You may never experience the healing. You might never experience the fulfilled promise. But what if because of a steadfast spirit inside of you, it paved the way for your children or grandchildren to follow that kind of faith? God, help us be rooted in you. Give us a steadfast spirit. Help us to anchor ourselves to you. Create in me a pure heart, O God. And the last one to have more of heaven inside of you is number three, a presence-centered life. In Psalm 51, David goes on to write, worship team, you can come on up. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. God, I've messed up. I need your mercy. I need your grace. God, I've done a wrong thing in your sight. I've sinned against you. And you alone have I sinned. God, would you create in me a pure heart? Would you renew a steadfast spirit within me? And God, please do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Why in the world would the very next thing out of David's mouth be, God, don't take your presence from me? Could it be, maybe, that David remembered what it looked like to watch a man who was once anointed by God and then watch the presence of God leave off of his life and watch what happened to that man. The man named Saul, the very person who was king, anointed king, and then it says God's presence and God's spirit left Saul. And for many years, David witnessed a man on what it looked like to be ruled by a man who did not have the presence of God and spirit of God. David had seen firsthand the fruit and what comes out of a man's life, death, murder, jealousy, hate, pride, envy, everything opposite of the fruits of the Spirit. What are the fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. God, do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Do not depart your presence off my life. 
David knew the only reason why he was where he was, the only reason why he'd experienced the victory that he experienced was because of the presence of God on his life. Apart from the presence of God, apart from a presence-centered life, we are nothing. We are nothing. So what we need most is we need God's presence continually in our minds and in our hearts. God, when you believed in Jesus, gave you the promise of his gifted spirit as a seal in your life. What that means is this. Your body is a temple where the Holy Spirit resides. We are walking carriers of God's presence. Now let me ask you a question. Just because you're a temple of the Holy Spirit doesn't mean you're really good at fostering his presence in your life. What does it look like to foster his presence? What does it look like to be a presence-centered person? Here's one way. Think on what's true. Think on what's right. Think on what's pure. Think on what's honorable. I'm 32 years old. I still have impure thoughts come to my mind. I've been serving Christ a while now. The minute I get an impure thought in my mind, I say, no, think on whatever is true, right, pure, lovely, admirable. I take captive every thought. That right there is fostering a presence-centered life. So many of us in the room live in sinful conditions and we expect and think it's normal. Or we think this will just always be here the rest of my life. No, remember, God prunes those he loves. He takes away and deals with the sin in our life and you better believe he gives you the grace and power to become the person of God he's calling you to become. Don't tell me God can't deliver you, and don't tell me God can't heal you of your addiction and the sin that so easily exists in our life. A presence-centered life. David said, the one thing I seek most is to dwell in the house of the Lord all my life. Better is one day in your house Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your presence than a thousand elsewhere. David was a man who sought after God's heart. David was a man of the presence, but even being a person of the presence doesn't excuse you from an opportunity to sin. But David's response saying, God created me a pure heart. God renew a steadfast spirit within me and God do not take your presence from me. What mattered most to David was just to be where God was, was to dwell with him, was to abide in him. Some of you in the room might be thinking, oh, I need to do a better job at this. Oh, I really need to rein in my spiritual life here. Oh, I really need to do this. Tonight, if that's where I've led you to get your thoughts to be on yourself, I have made a big mistake. Let me finish the sermon by saying this. The people loved having David as king, the people loved his leadership. The people trusted David. The people saw David bring about wealth and victory. But not even David could save the hearts of men. Not even David could save God's people. But all along, there was only meant to be one Savior and one person who could change the heart of men and save and rescue people. Jesus Christ. And aren't you thankful that it's not dependent on us or our works? But aren't you thankful that we are saved by, get, by grace through faith in Jesus? That we have an advocate for if anybody sins or anybody has sinned, we have an advocate, a father who's interceding at the right hand for us. I thank God for Jesus and who he is and the bloodshed upon our, on the cross that allows us every day to have more of heaven inside of us not because of how great we are, but because of how great he is. The quicker we can recognize how much we need him and how much we need what he's done for us, the more of heaven that can be inside of us. More of heaven inside of you. Tonight, how I wanted to respond is I wanted to have altars open. I wanted to have places open for us to say, God created me a pure heart. God, show me where I've been wrong. God, show me the patterns in my life that are grieving you. Holy Spirit, create in me a pure heart. God, would you renew a steadfast spirit within me? And God, may I walk in your presence daily. One thing I desire most is to be inside of you and 
to walk with you. Jesus, I thank you for an opportunity tonight for us to humble ourselves and humble our hearts to come before you and to recognize our, our need for you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. God, I thank you that you do not treat us at our, as our sins deserve. But God, instead of us taking a pit that we deserve, you place a crown on our head and you remove our sins as far as the east is, is from the west. In fact, you forget about them. Holy Spirit, we desire more of you. Less of us and more of you. If everybody could please stand with me. What I want to do tonight, how I want to close tonight, is I want to make and build room and opportunity for you to encounter Christ and for Christ to encounter you, for his love and grace to meet you where you are. Maybe just like that sheep, some of you are in the room and you already have the broken bones and you're already there. And what you need to be reminded of is the Father's love for you and what he did to go and get you. And maybe what you need to experience is him carrying you, him putting you on his shoulder and carrying you to be restored. Maybe some of you can resonate with David and everything's going just fine and just great. And in those moments can be dangerous because we can tend to slide and coast, but what we need is a healthy fear and a healthy reverence of God and being reminded of that. Everything you have is not yours. Everything you have is not because of you. Everything you have has been given to you by God. He gives and he takes. Therefore, we honor God and we live to glorify him. So tonight, these altars are open. I encourage you to respond tonight to the altar, and just because you walk forward doesn't mean you have this major sin grievance in your heart, but maybe the reason why you respond tonight is because you want more of heaven inside of you. So tonight as a church, can we end desiring more of Jesus, more of heaven inside of us, allowing the Holy Spirit to heal, minister, reconcile, and restore? On the count of three, I just would like everyone to move somewhere. Maybe it's not the front, maybe you go to the back. Maybe you move one aisle up. But on the count of three, I want everyone to move somewhere in here as a signifying to saying, God, I'm moving more, more of you. One, two, three. Every person to move somewhere. The altars are open. I also want to release during this time anybody in here to have the freedom to pray for one another, to encourage one another, for you to have the freedom to do that.